So welcome everyone. Hopefully everybody's doing well um, and staying safe in this COVID environment. Welcome to the August edition of the Sereni Nonprofit Connection. Today we are thrilled to have with us Maggie Medea uh, of ADP. Um, she's going to be talking today about employment in a post-COVID environment, establishing proper work from home for all those uh, companies that are still working remotely. I think it's an extremely important and timely topic with people starting to consider coming back to work and people trying to figure out what that new normal is going to be within their business environment in terms of um, a nonprofit environment, in terms of either kind of working more remotely or trying to figure all of these things out. So it's, it's great having you today, uh, Maggie, and, and thank you for being our guest. Absolutely, great to be here. Thanks for having me. So before we get started, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you and ADP work with the nonprofit sector. Yeah, so you know, Every single business industry we find has their own struggles and their own really specific things that are top of mind for the owners in those spaces. And um, you know, for, for non-for-profits, based on the data that we have and the research that we've done, we found that they predominantly struggle with, with talent um, because they typically offer lower wages, lower benefits, because they are non-for-profit organizations. They struggle with talent and they struggle with fear of the unknown. So like staying on top of things, usually people are wearing multiple hats in a non-for-profit situation where one person is trying to do the job of 10 people. So they really struggle with staying on top of like compliance, legislative updates, legal stuff. Um, so that's kind of where, where we see a trend. And then where we fill those gaps is we're really able to help non-for-profits not only attract talent, but really retain them for a very low cost, which is super important. So ADP has a bunch of you know built-in benefits that we offer on every single payroll platform even if it's the least expensive payroll platform they have they get things like an, an employee assistance program where you know they can get help with any health concerns mental health issues um, legal services we offer discount programs for employees if you know the not-for-profits not able to offer health benefits um, so that really helps with that retention and then obviously Obviously, we have an entire like HR and legal support where we can make sure that we're drilling down specifically into non-for-profits and how we can advise them appropriately to make good business decisions. So that's where we fill those main gaps for, for this industry. Awesome. One of the things that you mentioned as you were just kind of talking there, you know, you, you talked about um, some of the changes and stuff. How do nonprofit organizations or how should nonprofit organizations because uh, there's so much that people just don't know and you don't know what you don't know. How do you kind of, or how should they be um, staying on top of all of the changes that are taking place? Well, it's kind of a good way for them to be thinking through this. Yeah, so, um, you know, there's there's a couple of different methods. Um, there's like the DIY method of I'm just going to figure this out or I'm going to ask someone in my organization to figure this out. And the first two places you have to start is CDC right? And then your government websites. So, um, and OSHA. So that's where you need to start in this day and age and in this climate where we're really focused on health and safety. Um, CDC has come up with very specific guidelines, but again, it, it, it is um, very specific towards state, towards industry. So definitely looking into that um, more particularly, but there's a tons of regulations in there as well as OSHA. Um, and then just from like an overall like compliance perspective, having the right posters up um, regarding hand washing. Do I have to require masks? Um, you know, what does staggered scheduling look like? So those are the things that, you know, it's really important to stay on top of. Like I said, first stop would be CDC and OSHA. Um, but second stop, and again, for these owners and for these you know, um, partners and members of these non-for-profit organizations, the best thing that you can do right now is to think about outsourcing and to truly have someone who would take care of all of that. So at ADP, like our clients, it, it takes the guesswork out of it. They're not wondering everything they have to be on top of because we're on top of it for them and we create toolkits for them. i um, like, hey, like X, Y, and Z is what needs to be done. Here's how to implement it. It's going right into your employee handbook. Here are the policies you should distribute to your employees to have signed and returned to you. And then that way you're just fully insulate the, the business from ever feeling like there's any gaps in what should be, what should be done. Awesome. 
Um, so again, as the world starts moving to this new normal, whatever this new normal is going to be, or abnormal, I think it's the new abnormal, is abnormal. what we're going to yeah. gonna call it. Um, what are some of the key issues employers need to kind of consider as they start bringing people back to work? You mentioned a little bit in terms of you know, some of the signage and things like that, but um, I know I've, I've been hearing so many different things in terms of you know, uh, setting up the office the right way and you know, when someone comes into the office, you know, what do they need to be doing and what do they need to be considering? Yeah, so you know, there's a whole lot to be honest with you, that we have to be super aware of. So, um, you know, aside from having, you know, a, a specific cleaning and um, disinfecting schedule, that's super important. So what does that look like? Um, you know, the personal protective equipment, who's providing that? Like, are you providing it to employees? Are they expected to provide it to themselves? And is that documented somewhere so that everyone's on the same page and it never feels like discrimination? Um, you know, physical distancing, like, are we fully confident that everyone can remain six feet apart with our staggered scheduling? So again, like that type of thing, CDC OSHA related, but then when we think further about it, um, you know, we think about workers comp policies. This is something that people don't think about. If you have employees who are now working virtually, even if it's for part of the time, have you called your workers comp carrier to ensure that you are covered or that you've made it specific in your policy that you are not covering them for time spent in a virtual or remote location? A lot of employers haven't yet done this and they're, you know, if a, an employee cuts their hand in the kitchen making a salad during their work hour, Hours where they're clocked in, that's technically a workers' comp claim. So, you know, have we contacted our workers' comp provider to ensure that that's all buttoned up? There's also a return to work letter. So it's required to provide in writing a return to work letter to the employees. And it is very um, strongly advised that you put in there any new policies and regulations about what's expected of them, including some of this CDC OSHA type stuff that the business has to comply with, putting it in that return to work letter. Equally as important is if they give them that return to work letter, if the employee rejects it, they still have it on file that they did that. So their PPP loan won't have negative repercussions because part of the PPP loan forgiveness is that you maintain yep. staffing levels. Right. So if they're not maintaining staffing levels, they have to be able to explain why. Um, so if, if an employee rejects the return to work offer, that's not on them. So it wouldn't affect that PPP loan. Yeah, um, part of that, though, they also do have to notify unemployment that the employee did reject. Exactly. Right. Yep. So, so there's a lot when it comes to that. And then what else we're seeing too is that for, for businesses who are going to have employees work from home or work virtually, um, you know, how are they notifying them of like what's required of them, what their shift now is, you know, what equipment they have. So this is all that type of thing that we really need to think about um, both in like that live in-person rehire and back to work and then that virtual back to work. So you brought up a bunch of things in that uh, um, answer. Thank you. And yeah, that's so. <laughs> so the the uh, the couple things that that I want to kind of focus on. One is, you know, you mentioned that there are certain responsibilities as an employer that you have for um, individuals that are working remotely. Yeah. So what responsibilities do we have? What do we need to be doing in terms of setting things up in an employee's home if they are going to be working from home or working virtually? You know, I, I assume that there there's some sort of um, structure we have to set up or policies or, or something. So what is it that we should be thinking about? Yeah, so, um, you know, like I said, it is very advised at this time that you provide your employees um, with their general expectations in the form of a signed agreement. So if you send your employees an agreement for them to sign, it should include like, hey, while working from home, you're expected to complete your normal work assignments. These are your expected hours of availability and, you know, uh, productive time during the day. Um, 
Um, you also agree that your employer is not responsible for any um, injuries that may occur within your home. Um, and it's really important that you, you expect and that you have signed that the employee is responsible for maintaining confidentiality of the work, like we don't think about that, but if there's something that has to remain confidential and it's in their house, out in the open on their desk and they're having you know, people over, like what does that look like for a confidentiality for your business? Um, and also that they will maintain a safe and healthful environment so that does not negatively impact the business. So that's kind of like the step one. But then step two is really thinking about like, all right, I have these virtual employees now, like how the heck do I know if they're even working or if they're catching up on their favorite Netflix show, right? So, you know, we see a lot of business owners who are like, how do I track this? Like what is even going on during the day? And although like we can't big brother, like spy on people, right? As much as we might want to, I, I've learned this the hard way. I'm a manager. You can't do that. Um, as much as you might want to really see what they're doing, we have to kind of just make sure that our employees are engaged. So there's a lot of different ways that you can drive engagement through, um, you know, performance reviews, uh, through setting specific metrics in terms of what you want them to be able to accomplish on like a daily basis, a weekly basis and having check-in points. And then, you know, like I said, like offering them something like an EAP program where they feel like really supported by the company, the more engaged the employee is, the more productive they'll be for you without you forcing it. Um, so I think like those are some really important things we have to think about. Um, and there's a ton of really good tools we can use to do that. So I just want to make sure. So we're not allowed to break into their houses and set up cameras. No, I know. I, I thought we could, but <laughs> that, that it, that's, it's, seem a real, right. like, it's a real slap on the wrist type of situation. You shouldn't do it. So for those people who are coming back into the office and not staying at home, so they're coming yep. back in, I guess there's a couple of questions. My, my first question is, um, is there anything we can do? Um, because obviously, you know, um, people have lives and people have to live their lives and do what they're going to do. And, and um, but when they live their lives, if they're going out and they're not being safe when they're outside of the office, they could be increasing the risk of the people who are working within the office. So what can we do in terms of, if anything, uh, to, um, kind of monitor or help to ensure that if people are going to be a little more risky in their personal lives, that that doesn't affect the office. And then what are we allowed to do in order to uh, create regulations and enforce those regulations within the office environment? Yeah. So again, like I, I would love to walk through just like a, some best practices, but always consult. I have to preface with that. CDC, OSHA, and, you know, a prof like an HR professional or a legal professional. But from what we've seen from like a best practice perspective, like ensuring that your employees wear a face mask, social distancing, you can ask your employees to take their temperature. Um, so that is one way that you can um, kind of monitor. And then what's most important of all is just having a very strong designated outline protocol. Okay, so we have to deal with OSHA, um, but then also, you know, in terms of making sure that you are able to take their temperature, um, but what's most important is having a very specific and outlined protocol for what happens should someone display signs and symptoms. So that's really what the key piece is here. Do you have the ability to isolate that employee? You have to report it to the CDC if you have any inkling that someone might be sick um, you have to report that so making sure that you have a protocol in place on what will happen if someone is sick and I know people are really uncomfortable coming into the workplace right now again like not knowing how risky their peers have been um, but the best that we can do is really manage through the social distancing wearing a mask staggered scheduling and ultimately having a very strong protocol around and what what does happen if someone seems to have been infected or sick and asking people to not come in if they have any signs or symptoms of being under the weather. So um, what are we allowed um, to ask or require from employees? Because obviously you've got HIPAA concerns and everything else. 
So what is it that we are allowed to, to ask? What can we have them bring in in terms of doctor's notes or uh, communication about whether they did or didn't have an, an issue? Um, you know, is it, is it self-reported? Is it an honesty system? Or is there something more that we can do? It really is predominantly that like self-reported honesty system. Unfortunately, um, because of the HIPAA violations, there's not a ton we can do. However, um, if an employee is returning to work, we can require a doctor's note certifying fitness for duty. So we are able to do that before they come back into the workplace. Um, but you cannot require an employee to be COVID tested because that would fall under the bucket of requiring a medical examination which could fall into like some ADA issues but you can require like I said that they are certified fitness for duty um, basically to perform their job tasks um, you also likewise cannot require an employee to have an antibody test um, so you cannot do that um, and so those are some of like the cans and can'ts you have to be again like tread lightly um, and you may require your employees to wear PPE masks gloves um, anything like that is completely allowable um, so so those are those are some of like the cans and can'ts but it does get a little sticky with HIPAA um, but like I said that that fitness for duty test can be can be done that, that interesting part of that fitness for duty is, you know, a, a doctor signs off on a note because the individual maybe had a test four days earlier, but you don't know what happened during that four day period of time and what the exposure was. So I think you're right. You know, that whole aspect of um, wearing masks and staying safe and creating a safe environment and making sure there's regular cleanings and everything else is probably a hell of a lot more important than, you know, relying upon, you know, anything that's coming from a doctor or an individual because ultimately, you know, unless someone's kind of cloistering themselves within their homes and not really moving much, um, there's really yeah. very little uh, we can do. What you can do too, though, is if, um, if someone is showing against any symptoms of COVID-19, you are allowed to send them home. So you can send them home from your workplace without any negative repercussions. Um, you are allowed to take their temperature. However, um, you need to maintain the confidentiality of this information. So if you're taking their temperature, you can't say like, hey, Bob, guess what Jim's temperature was, right? So um, we can't share that. Um, and you can ask your employees whether they've traveled um, to affected regions. So you are allowed to ask those type of questions. You're allowed to ask them um, if they are in a home with someone who has been diagnosed with COVID-19. You are allowed to require them to notify you if they've come into contact with someone with COVID-19. So there are some rights that we have, um, but we cannot force them to have like a medical test done. So do you require a, a daily questionnaire that people um, fill out? I absolutely would. Um, again, like it would be the honesty system, but I absolutely would. Um, you know, I know my husband works in the city every day. He has his temperature taken and he fills out a form on who he's come into contact with. If any of them had signs or symptoms of COVID-19, um, if he's traveled out of, um, you know, the state in the last 14 days. So you absolutely can do that. And you have every right as an employer to send that person home if you feel like they are a risk to the rest of your employee base. So if you believe that someone was exposed or potentially exposed, other than sending them home, especially if they've been in the office for the last week, what do you have to do within the office, you know, you in terms of the rest of your them. staff? Yeah, you have to tell them. So if you have, again, if you have any inkling or any concerns, you want to first report it um, to the CDC and you also want to make your people aware. Again, you don't want to go into who um, that person is, but make them aware that you had someone um, in the office that you believe to have been, you know, at risk or infected and maybe suggest that they get tested or be cautious. You want to make them aware of, of any health concerns. Okay. The other thing, going back to um, what you were talking about before, you talked a little bit about um, the need for establishing policies. Um, and 
you know, when you're looking at those uh, work from home environment and having people work, and I know we're bouncing around a little bit, but people working from home, um, what sort of policies should people be considering in a work from home environment? What sort of policies should they be putting in place other than the don't watch Netflix policy? Yeah, it's a big one. That's a big policy. Um, like I said, Disney Channel is fine. It's just Netflix. Is that the only one? That, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Disney's always fair game. Okay. Um, like I said, like I think that from a policy perspective, like timekeeping is crucial, especially if you have non-exempt employees, you have to have some sort of time tracking system where they are clocking in and they are clocking out and you're paying them for any overtime. Like it can turn into a very sticky situation if they're just working from home, but they're non-exempt and you're not accurately paying them for their hours worked. And that can work both ways, right? Like they might be working a lot less than is expected of them, or they might be working more and not being paid for it because we're not clocking in and out appropriately. So that's very, very important um, is that timekeeping piece. Um, and then, like I said, you know, performance tracking is really, really crucial in this um, environment. They have to have, I would say, daily or weekly metrics. Um, you know, through our ADP system, we have an entire performance tracking toolkit where they have to check off the boxes on everything that they've done and report and record um, what they have completed. Um, so again, like running document that protects you as an employer, if you feel that they, that employee isn't working or their workload starts to slip or they're, you ping them at you know 3 p.m. and they're supposed to be available until five and they don't get back to you for an hour, having good documentation around that is gonna be really crucial to effectively managing employees that are virtual. Um, and then like I said, again, like those engagement tools are key. So, you know, one platform we use is called Standout. Um, it's a Marcus Buckingham tool where basically it um, identifies through a quick quiz people's strengths and, um, you know, their strength finder to be able to use their strengths. People who use their strengths every day are more engaged, blah, 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 the whole thing, right? But it's also a really cool check-in tool. So my employees check in with me every single week on like what went well that week, what they struggled with, like do they feel like they use their strengths every day like what was a damper to them like what do they dread doing they submit it to me and that way I can continue to drive engagement by ensuring that they're productive they're busy like I know what they're working on so I think that that is is so crucial when we have people working from home because you don't have that same daily interaction yeah I, I, I find that there's a lot more meetings and um kind of forced interaction just for that yes. that purpose yeah and there should be i know and trust me i'm the last one to be like let's be on meetings all day but it's so important and also you know the video capacity is important too nobody likes seeing on video i get it but what it does is it eliminates distractions so if you have a meeting and you don't if you don't encourage and facilitate Coworker and group interaction via web-based, video-based um, mediums, you're gonna struggle to have people engage with one another. So you eliminate distractions by having the video because I can't be making my oatmeal while we're having this conversation. But if I'm not, you know, if I'm not on video, I pop that that phone on mute. I could, you know, be cooking up a pancake breakfast and nobody would have any of the wiser, but I, I didn't hear a word you said. So I think that really thinking about how to leverage technology to ensure people are engaged and paying attention and not multitasking and not, you know, uh, shopping online is really, really key to having engaged employees who are retaining what you're talking to them about. Yeah, and if they're making pancakes, I better get some. Exactly. That's also important. You need to save time for delivery. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the other things we talked about is that there's all these changing regulations that are occurring yeah. with respect to the employee employer relationship. Right. It, it just seems like there's just so much happening and, and so many new um, acts and regulations that, are, that have been coming out. Um, what are the key things that nonprofits should be thinking about right now? And, and what are the key um, regulations that they really should be monitoring? So I did my research. Um, and I was looking into what some statistics were regarding like the not-for-profit industry um, going through COVID. And I mean, 
Similarly uh, to most industries, there was an 83% um, of not-for-profits uh, reported decline in revenue, right, which we're seeing across the board, like that's understandable, um, but we're also seeing that they had to lay off or furlough anywhere from like 50 to 60% of organizations had some significant layoffs and furloughing employees, again, which makes sense, revenues decline, staff need declines. Um, so as it specifically pertains to not-for-profits and those two kind of um, pain points for them, some things that they should absolutely be aware of is how to properly lay off slash furlough an employee and how to rehire them correctly. So that's equally as important. If they have health insurance, um, how to reinstate their health benefits or were they ever, you know, put on pause? Like what is their new eligibility? So ensuring that there is um, continuity with their benefit plans is really important. If they were furloughed or laid off and they're coming back now, it's really important that you maintain their pay if you're seeking that PPP loan. So that is another important, not only maintaining staffing, but maintaining pay levels is a big piece of that PPP loan forgiveness. Um, yeah, you, if can't, you can't drop the salary by more than 25%. So you have to make sure that that salary stays within that 75% that range. Yep. Exactly. So that is super important as well. Um, and then, you know, um, ultimately, like I mentioned before, if an employee refuses um, to return to work because they're making more on unemployment, which hopefully that ended when the $600 stimulus checks ended on July 31st. Um, but we saw a lot of people who were making more on unemployment, so they didn't want to go back to their jobs. So next steps is obviously having that return to work letter notifying um, the unemployment insurance agency so that you're not slammed with additional unemployment insurance increases. Like that's one of the only controllable line items business owners have is that unemployment insurance. I mean, people don't understand that that can be as low as 0.4% or as high as 10%. And that's a percentage of gross wages. So when you start off at that 4.1%, you know, that can go up and up and up. And I don't know what they're going to do. I don't know if they're going to right size that in the future based on everything that's gone on. But the less and less unemployment claims you can have and for as little as they can go on for, the better um, when it comes to how much you're paying into that pot. One of the other challenges that nonprofits have is nonprofits in New York State have the ability to go self-insured. And many nonprofit organizations for unemployment have gone self-insured. And over the years, that was great because they were paying them. less and less and less into the unemployment system. But now with all of the furloughing and laying people off, um, there's been a big uptick in the amount of money that the nonprofit sector has to lay out um, and even though the federal government is, is, uh, has agreed to pay 50% of it, it it's still a, a big number. Uh, I had a nonprofit organization who last week got a bill for $25,000, you know, for, yeah. you know, so it, it's, it's another challenge that the nonprofit sector has to deal with. And the frustration that the nonprofit sector is having right now is that, um, even though, um, some of these individuals were asked to come back to work or they were told there's a job or they left on their own accord, you know, two months ago, they're winding up collecting against the nonprofit. So you try to challenge it. And unfortunately, um, in this environment, it just seems like you go for unemployment, you automatically get paid and, and it doesn't matter because they're, they're just, there's so many claims. They're just pushing, pushing the money out. That's why we just have to do like, Every much every bit we can to insulate it. So, like I said, the return to work letter and ultimately, you know, ensuring that you're notifying them. But also, ADP has an entire team, an unemployment insurance management team, our SUI team, and they actually fight claims for our clients. So, if they get an unemployment claim, it comes in the mail. They mail it right into our desk, and we take care of the the conversation and um, kind of dealing with that from there. So that's a good piece too. Um, and then another thing that, you know, is hopefully good though, from a revenue perspective for not-for-profits is I saw that with the CARES Act, a taxpayer for, um, 2020 can now deduct up to a hundred percent of adjusted gross income. So that should really encourage donors, um, to, you know, donate a little more freely, even with the concern of revenues. Um, so I thought that that was a really awesome piece, um, that they're able to contribute so much more. So 
I think obviously I'm sure everyone in the not-for-profit sector is aware of these changes, but um, just getting that out to the people who want to support them um, is going to be critical to ensuring that their revenue can bounce back quickly. So with the um, some of the new provisions that um, President Trump has kind of put in play with respect to the payroll taxes, um, has ADP uh, come up with any way on how they're going to be addressing this yet? Yeah, um, I mean, ADP, and you know, you can talk to a lot of our, um, the members of the account community, we've been told that we've done an amazing job um, with these reports. So everything from an easy fill PPP loan application where you log in, we pre-populate your information from what you already have and the loan's done, but we have added in um, everything from the employee um, retention credit line item. Um, the FFCRA has to be reported separately now on the 941 as well as um, different benefit caps. So the 941, went from a two-page document to a three-page document, as I'm sure you've seen um, for quarter two. So we tackled all of that. Um, just ensuring from a CARES Act perspective, you're able to break out the wages appropriately. So ADP has, I mean, worked tirelessly throughout this to ensure that we are on the ball with these changes. We have an entire page when you first log on to our portal now where you can hit COVID. It'll show you all the reports that you need. Um, it'll easy click, one click, add the line items that are required. Um, it's just taking the guesswork out of it for our clients, which is our ultimate goal is to help them get back on their feet. Um, so I've been unbelievably impressed with what we've been able to do. Um, and a lot of our you know partners have been too. So it's been really great for our clients. What, what about some of the other provisions like the uh, impact on family medical leave and you know, some of the new provisions that have come out with respect to if someone does um, come down with COVID and you know, some of the uh, what employers should do and what sort of benefits or sort of um, other things that employers can, employers can look at? Yeah, so, um, you know, what we have is a really awesome HR legal support team. Um, and what we find is that there's so much overlap, especially with issues like these. There's a lot of overlap where HR bleeds right into legal, which is why it's so important to have both kind of working congruently. So with our platforms, we offer licensed 15 years SHRM experience, SHRM certified HR professionals that work directly with our legal operations to ensure that these are you know steadfast decisions that are being made in a way that insulates the business is completely compliant so we're supporting our our um, businesses in every aspect of how to appropriately do all of this in a way that's fully in compliance CDC OSHA New York State federal um, and we're multi-state so if you have clients or you have part of your business that's in Pennsylvania or Connecticut or New Jersey, you may find that the regulations there are different. Um, so we're fully on top of that in every state. Um, so that's been really helpful, again, to our clients to just know that they don't have to be the expert. Like they can be the expert on what their not-for-profit cause is um, and we'll take care of all of the back office work that comes into being compliant in this day and age in our new abnormal. I like so, that. Yeah. So when 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 we're looking at um, a nonprofit organization is trying to kind of make a decision as to how they're going to operate in this new abnormal environment, um, do I bring people back? Do I not bring people back? Um, what factors should kind of come into that decision making process in terms of um, you know for them in terms of whether it makes sense to to try to do things more remotely, to try to you know get more bodies into the office. Um, and, and what factors do they need to really worry about in terms of, you know, when they make those decisions or should they be considering in that decision making process? I think as much as people are able to work effectively from home, you dramatically lower your risk of having 
illness spread. So if you want to keep your employees safe, which obviously everyone wants to keep their employees safe, but thinking bigger picture, if you want your, your entire workforce to remain in a state of being able to be productive, I would say it makes a lot of sense to have people work from home um, as much as possible, depending on their function. Um, but you know, when you're kind of weighing that, and you also want to weigh like the ROI, if things have been going really well over the past couple of months, maybe you don't want to pay for overhead anymore. Like maybe that brick and mortar location wasn't a necessary piece of your business and you can cut that out of your P and L statement. Um, but if you find you're really struggling, um, and people aren't being super effective and aren't productive and there needs to be more in-person collaboration, I would just say you do so only to the extent necessary, at least for now. Um, I wouldn't bring everybody back all at once. I would stagger it. I would have people come in on separate days of the week. I just don't see the need to bring back full force unless you're in one of those essential industries, unless you're in that manufacturing healthcare. Um, but for, for the non-essential industries, um, you know, you really have to weigh out, is it worth it? So you kind of are weighing like I'm getting less productivity out of my employees from home, but if I bring them in, I could get people sick and send my entire workforce home for an extended period of time. I also lose time with their commute. I lose time, um, with their engagement levels like maybe people coming into the office every day aren't as engaged because they're they are losing time with their family they got used to that work-life balance that they had in March April May now you're telling them to come back five days a week 40 hours a um, five days a week, 40 hours a week. And you know, you might lose some engagement from people who were enjoying that work-life balance, who were enjoying that flexibility. So I think it all ties, it's it's obviously a big conversation um, that you wanna have, but I think that you really have to think about your return on investment. And if you can get people to be actively engaged productive, hitting metrics from home. Um, I do think that it is overall a win, but I think when you have to have people come in, even if it's a quarterly, a monthly meeting, what have you, you do that. And no one's required, um, an employer isn't required to allow their employees to work from home, by the way. So if you want your employees to come in, they have, they have to come in. Um, so in order to fulfill their job duties, it's really up to the employer to just dictate that. Um, but again, I think that those are all those thoughts that go into play, but I wouldn't just say like, great, I'm going to have a virtual workforce and then not change what you're doing. You have to invest in training. Think about the older generations. Maybe they're not comfortable with technology. So maybe you're going to lose that part of your workforce. And maybe that part of your workforce is really important for your brand and the ideas that they bring. So I think making sure the training and development is there, the technology is there, the engagement pieces are are there with employee assistance programs, standout type platforms where you can really get a gauge of how they're feeling and performance tracking in those metrics. If you have a solid, solid foundation um, and what that looks like, that infrastructure, then I think like you, you know, you prevent yourself from dealing with as much of this CDC, OSHA, oh my God, there's so many like health and safety rule type of things that you will face in a, in a live environment. You brought up engagement, and that's one of the things that I think when you're in a virtual environment, you kind of struggle with. Yeah. Um, how do you keep people connected or employees connected to your company? How do you create that camaraderie that happens when people are around the office? Um, you know, what, what do you see happening out there from a HR perspective in terms of trying to motivate people to kind of have that, you know, uh, rah-rah team spirit? Yeah. And, you know, it's a good, that's a great question. And it's something that, um, you know, I have to figure out every day. I have eight associates that I need to get pumped up every day to talk about payroll taxes, right? Um, not an easy feat, by the way. Um, but what I'm yeah, yeah. <laughs> who wants to do taxes? Um, but what I've found to be really successful is, like I said, like, getting the visual as much as possible, like as much as you can get them on a Zoom type platform um, to be able to interact and see each other's faces is great. And then like, think about culture, like the culture piece is really important. So maybe it's a virtual 
trivia or a virtual happy hour or a virtual book club. I don't know. We were reading books to um, our associates' kids, the managers. We were taking turns. Um, so like, you want to think about how you can engage and think about how you can keep your employees engaged in that way. So they're like, why would I want to leave You know, this company? Like, yes, maybe I'm not making as much money as I could be making you know, at this other company, but they engage me every day. Like I feel empowered to do the work I'm doing. I'm leveraging my strengths every day. My, my boss or my direct advisor, um, that I report to checks in with me and, and checks out my metrics. Like I have very specific attainable goals that I'm expected to reach every day and every week so that I know how I'm doing. That's something that's usually like very often overlooked, I think. And especially in a virtual environment, you know, you have to be more micromanagey than you ever had to be before, but you have to in order for the employee to even feel like they have a purpose. If you just, you know, your employees off to the races, like good luck, talk to you Friday. They don't have check-ins or metrics. They don't know how they're doing. It's so important for us to be extremely specific with our expectations, what has to be done and then celebrate when it is um, to keep those employees engaged. Um, what are the key takeaways that people should take from uh, today's discussion? I think from a key takeaway perspective, um, you know, like I've mentioned, you went into business for what you went into business to do, what you're passionate about, um, whatever that may be. Maybe it's some sort of shelter. Maybe it's, you know, a, a bakery, a museum, uh, whatever the case may be. You went into it because you had a passion for whatever that is. Um, and, you know, people who are trying to take on the responsibility, the liability, the education of all the intricacies of compliance in my opinion, were crazy in December of 2019. But now, in August of 2020, it is a whole new animal. And, you know, it, it's not just like, oh, I need a, a labor law poster to tell people what minimum wages, like, what's that going to do? It's people's safety, right? It's, it's health. It's keeping people safe. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to dabble with that in a way that, you know, negatively impacts anyone on my team or makes them feel that I don't care about their well-being. Because one of the biggest pieces of engagement is that employees feel like you care about their well-being. So what I want you to take away is take this seriously. There's a ton of resources out there, but don't try to be the expert. That's why companies like ADP are helping their clients. That's why we employ HR, SHRM certified advisors who have experience, who know the ins and outs of the legalities of things, and who will advise you on what to do so that you can focus on bringing that revenue back in, keeping your employees engaged, leveraging the tools and technology that we have. Like, let it be there as a tool that you use um, and outsourcing right now is, is the best thing you can possibly do. Awesome. So if people wanted to reach you, how would they go about doing it? So my email is Maggie, M-A-G-G-I-E. You can see my name at the bottom here, I think. Dot Medea, M-A-D-I-A, similar to Medea's family reunion, but instead of E-A, it's I-A, M-A-D-I-A, at A-D-P, funny story, once I tried to tell someone A-D-P, and they were like, oh, A-D-C, I'm like, no, A-D-P, and I said, alpha data potato, so that was an embarrassing moment, dot com, so Maggie.Medea at A-D-P for potato, dot com. Um, and you can reach me that way. Um, ping me and I'll be happy to connect with you and reach out if you have any questions at all. Awesome, Maggie. That was, that was incredible. That was uh, so much fun and high energy on your part. Very high energy, just like a golden retriever. Awesome. Right. Thank you so much, Ken. It was a pleasure. Thanks, thanks a lot. So everybody next month in lieu of the uh, Serini nonprofit connection, we'll be hosting our annual uh, Let's Imagine event on Wednesday, September 16th. Uh, where we'll have with us the CEOs of the five uh, winners of the Imagine Awards for you to be able to ask questions to. So uh, think about joining us on that. Uh, in addition, we're going to be uh, setting up for uh, next month a webinar series that uh, will be uh, working with your audit committees and, and trying to give you some insight in how your audit committees can be more effective. 
Um, stay tuned. We'll give you some uh, times and dates for those meetings too. So thank you everybody for joining. Stay safe and awesome job, Maggie. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. Bye, Ken. Take care, everyone.